So uh, welcome, yes, it's, it's, it's my 10th book and it's about um, the, um, the transition of all the ancient pagan symbols um, into Christianity and it's a fascinating subject, although there's been lots of books about symbolism before, you can pick books up galore about <coughs> symbolism, coffee table books, I wasn't aware there'd ever been one that purely dealt with this transition between how um, virtually all the pagan symbols uh, and uh, made their transition into Christianity. And a lot of the myths as well, it's a fascinating subject. So I'm going to push on because I've only got an hour. Um, that really can be a tenant to for today, really, can't it? The real magic lies not in seeking new landscapes, but in seeing things with new eyes. This is the secret, I think. This is why we're all here, um, seeing things that perhaps uh, archaeologists... Any archaeologists here? No? Oh, good. No. <coughs> um, no, it's, it's, it's the way of, of, of seeing things where, where science perhaps doesn't go. And I, I think, I don't, personally, the last 10 years, I've seen science and alternative research coming closer together, which can only be better. Um, so, um, as you know, I do Stone Seeker tours and Stone Seeker publishing. So, for the last 20 years, I've been studying sacred sites and ancient cultures, like a lot of you have been doing. And uh, in following alignments across the, uh, across the landscape, I ended up at a lot of churches. And of course, that's no mystery. A lot of churches are built on ancient power places and ancient pagan places. And uh, of course, I started going into those churches. I started looking at the stained glass windows. And I thought, hang on, I recognize that symbol. I've seen that before. I've been to Egypt. I've been to Malta. That reminds me of something. So I started looking into the whole subject. So the, the, this project was on the back burner, really, for about 20 years. And in the end, I thought, I, I've just got to to put all this together, which is why I'm standing in front of you. So um, one thing I hadn't banked on is that um, the church has embraced the book. At this point, you're all supposed to go, ooh. ooh. <laughs> I love you guys. Um, so um, yeah, so uh, I, I, my book certainly isn't, uh, isn't a church knocking book, having a go at the church. What on earth is the point of that? So. Um, but um, it's now on, uh, on sale in several cathedral bookshops and uh, Glastonbury Abbey bookshop. And, that w and I think I'm going to make this reverend my agent, actually, because <laughs> she's, she's in love with the book. So uh, that was something I hadn't... I hadn't uh, sort of, and, and one vi I did this talk, uh, a version of this talk, a shortened version, a WI group recently, and the local village... She said, I'm the vicar of the church. I thought, oh, here we go. And um, she said, your, your book has actually embellished my religion. And I thought, wow, that's really nice. So uh, she says, you've showed me where everything comes from without actually detracting from the message. So uh, that was exactly what I wanted to do. So there is a difference between signs and symbols, which I go at in some uh, length in the book. Uh, signs are designed to be appreciated and understood in a split second, um, regardless of language. They're often an instruction, advice, or a warning. Like this one, Moose Crossing, when I went to Vermont to speak at a conference, I was there for a week. Did I see a... M Glenn, you've got no moose over there really, have you, mate? No. No, it's just a tourism thing. You put all these signs up. Do we see moose? No. So obviously it's telling you what's going to happen. It's a sign. Symbols, on the other hand, may be embellished with endless meanings and interpretations, often beyond the grasp of the rational mind. The great thing, Tim Frake said, is about myths is that they're often pregnant. They're always pregnant with new meanings. You might have written a book, uh, you might have read a book, the Magogian or, you, uh, or the Bible even, or some other um, book, New Agey book by someone you admire. You might have read it 10 years ago and got something out of it, but then you go back to that book now and don't you get a lot, a lot more from it because you have changed, your, your level of knowledge has changed and uh, I think this is, this is the same about myths and, uh, and symbols even. And uh, symbols are wonderful, they're always multifaceted. We could put a symbol, I mean, you, you put the ohm, you could put the ohm on that wall now. What is, what is the ohm symbol? It's just a few wag wiggly lines, isn't it? And a dot. And uh, yet you, you meditate on that, it could, it could change your consciousness. So again, symbols possess such power in themselves. So sorry I haven't got time to do all these sections. Virtually every section that you find in a Bible or a church, I have covered in the book, but obviously, this is, a, this is a shortened version, so everything, everything you want there, I think.
So, of course, the earliest symbolism is nature symbolism, even today. Nature was the genesis of man's preoccupation with symbols. Uh, natural mathematics and natural geometry is in the whole of nature. Uh, the Fibonacci sequence in the unfolding nautilus shell. The hexagons and hexagrams here, the unfolding spirals, of course, you get. So man spotted this, you know, thousands and thousands of years ago and sought to copy that and, and sort of enhance that unfolding mathematics to his own end, I believe. So, and uh, people were spotting things that resembled something, and I think as a result of that, thought that those objects perhaps um, held the spirit, perhaps, of what they represent. Most of the Native American sacred sites uh, are natural objects, the same as with the, um, the Aborigines of Australia, a tree or a rock that might resemble something. And when that happens, they think that the spirit is, is present in that object. Uh, the top right one is Elephant Dolmen on Sardinia. It's a natural basalt exposure shaped like an elephant, and yet it's got a Bronze Age tomb, you can see at the bottom side of it. Um, do you like this one? This is called Mushroom Rock. Can you see me sitting at the base of it? Oh. Look at me. This is about 30 feet high, 25 feet high. Uh, the shape of a mushroom. Oh. Look at that. I'd love to see the frying pan that this goes in. <laughs> Serious. Um, and the point is, it's surrounded by Bronze Age sacred sites. And we know that uh, my book on West Kennet Longbar, I show that the shamans were using <coughs> magic mushrooms thousands of years ago. So, of course, our Bronze Age ancestors would have seen the shape of this rock as highly relevant. The bottom right one is a modern one today. It's um, some of you might have come on our minibus tour to Alton Priors, and uh, there was this big 3,000 year old hollowed out yew tree. And this spirit, this tree spirit, is in there now. And uh, amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. And that does pull on you, believe me. So natural symbolism. So of course, man's p uh, obsession with symbols really goes way back. Um, some of the earliest cave paintings from Europe, from Europe, Lascaux, and all that sort of thing. And the Venuses, of course, thousands of these have been found all over Europe. No, most of them female, not exclusively, but most of them. Some of these going back 35, 40,000 years. Some of it perhaps is sympathetic magic. You put the spirit of you, the painting of the animal you wish to hunt and you connect with the spirit of the beast, hoping that he'll give himself up for the hunt. This is one I like. This, this shaman seems to be changing into a bird. Uh, his phallus is pointing towards, his, his, to a bison. Good luck there, mate. To a, the, <laughs> so, not quite sure. That looks a pretty fierce rite of initiation to me. So, um, so yes, I'd much rather encounter this lady than this one, actually. <laughs> um, so, yes, the, the preoccupation with symbols goes right back to man's earliest expression of spirituality. And don't forget, symbols predate writing. It's a bit like, uh, I liken it to a human infant. A human infant can write and scribble something. You put a, a paint box in a, in a, or a pencil in front of a two- or three-year-old, and he'll make something of it long before he can write or read or use the alphabet. And I think it was the same with mankind. A few more recent examples here from uh, Malta, from Avery, that's an original face called the Shark Stone. That was there when the stone was erected, the Gunderstroop Cauldron. And of course, arguably the greatest expression of symbolism in art, of course, was by the Egyptians. So um, sometimes um, the landscape itself can be used as a medium for expressing one's spirituality. The White Horse of Offington there, top left, which I think uh, uh, I, I fell, and some other researchers think it's a dragon. It's not a horse at all, it's a dragon. The best place to see, well, one of the places that interacts with the horse right in front of it is Dragon Hill. Well, there's a clue. It's not Horse Hill. And, of course, Gary and Caroline have shown that the lines of the Bellinus line go right down the horse. And I think Guy Underwood, many years ago, found that the, uh, the lines of energy match up with the profile of the horse. This is the CERN giant, of course. I talked about this a few years ago. Um, and um, I proved that he's 2,000 years old because of some alignments with Orion, which I think Paul has been doing research on. So a lot of uh, Orion is important all across the world. But uh, this represents, you know, whoever this guy represents, whether it's Osiris or Orion or Hercules or any of the other gods, um, you know, whoever comes down that valley over the last 2,000 years can recognize that as an archetype from its own culture. So some, some symbols um, totally transcend different cultures. They are what um, Jung called archetypal. So sometimes the whole landscape can be used to express one's <coughs> spirituality. So there's quite a long section in the book called Cometh the Cross, and it tells the story of how um, Christianity staggered. It didn't sweep across Europe, it staggered across Europe. Christianity wasn't met with people 
at the edge of the village saying, please convert me. Well, we don't want to know the goddess anymore, all those sun gods. Of course it didn't. And the load of missionaries who uh, met grisly ends as a result, of course, is, uh, is well known. But eventually it did sweep across Europe, uh, mainly through Rome and through Egypt. And uh, it, it absorbed on its way ancient universal symbols and myths to help promote its own agenda. Why wouldn't you? There's a load of myths and stories and symbols already around which people recognise and can relate to. Bring them into the new religion and it makes, makes the idea, of the, the job of conversion, of course, much, much easier. And of course, some of these symbols and myths are, 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 have a power unto themselves. So of course, they can literally empower your religion as you go along. Another difference between Christianity and Judaism, really, uh, um, sorry, Christianity, first of all, is that Jesus is just born once at Easter. Shall I tell the Easter egg joke? Shall I? But that's such a nice audience. Okay, okay. Um, yeah, Jesus is hanging on the cross, you know, probably bad taste joke. Jesus is hanging on the cross, and, and, um, and uh, he's about to speak his last words, and they're all gathering round to get these profound words that will start a religion. And he turns round to all the disciples, he turns down to all the disciples, and he said, don't eat my Easter egg, I'll be back on Sunday. <laughs> Okay, I hope he was worth the, the distraction. So, um, <laughs> so, Jesus is just born once, of course. The old sun gods who were replaced are perpetually born each year with the cycles of the earth and the sun. The biggest change for me of Christianity and Judaism and Islam, if you like, as well, was the total denial and denigration of the divine feminine. That's the big difference. You look at all the ancient religions, gods and goddesses have equal parity. They are worshipped equally, as many temples to the goddess as there are to the gods. But of course, when Christianity comes, God is sudden, singular, is suddenly a man. So uh, this is the big change as well. The, the denigration, not just the denial of the divine, divine, divine feminine, but she is there in Christianity, as we'll see later. And also the Gnostic Gospels were denied. Uh, all those new Gospels that were found in the desert over many years, it always seemed strange to me why, you know, they've been authenticated by archaeologists, so why haven't they been incorporated into later reprints of the Bible? No. No, because I think the main reason, they're a bit heretical, and of course they empower women as well, a lot of those, a lot of those uh, which the early church fathers were not interested in. Um, next section is there's a new God in town. Um, Pope Gregory sends an edict out in 595 AD. He says, look, we're having a bit of a problem converting the British and uh, Northern Europeans. And so we'll try a new tact. We'll send our missionaries out and we won't destroy the pagan sites or try to. We'll actually put our churches on them. What a shrewd move that was. A stroke of brilliance, really, when you think about it. And uh, there's some great examples here. So people can still come to their old sacred sites that they've been worshipping for thousands of years. But of course now there's a new god in town. And it makes conversion a lot easier. As well, of course, as the fact that they are all, the churches will pick up on the energetic properties of the sites that are there. I'm sorry, for some reason the, the very bottom of the uh, words is being chopped off here. There's some great examples of what we call site evolution. La Hogue on Jersey, Norman Chapel on top of a Neolithic tomb. Knowlton, another Neolithic henge with a church um, inside. And this is one I found in Portugal. This is actually a dolmen. If you can, you can imagine the capstone is still standing behind the roof there. And they've Christianized it by putting a chapel right inside the dolmen. It's the, literally the omphalos of the whole village. It's right in the central square. And it's a great example. All of these are of how the, the new religion sought to replace the old by building on its sacred sites. Um, there's a section called the turning year, and a lot of you might know that a lot of the saints' days, a lot of the Christian days, are takeovers from old pagan events. I go into it quite extensive. Even the days of the weeks and the divisions of time are nearly all based on ancient gods and things like that. Uh, Samhain, of course, is, uh, it, it was turned into Halloween and All Hallows' Eve. It's uh, Carol's nice pumpkin there. God, that is a, I've got to admire the skill. Look at this. That is a carved pumpkin. Can you believe that? Okay. You're taking commissions, Carol? She, yes, she says, I need the money. <laughs> yeah. So, um, so, so some uh, festivals, like the Abbot's Bromley Horn Dance, of course, um, continue old practices. Sometimes it's not a continuous tradition, but it's a revival, perhaps, sometimes, of things that have gone before. Uh, and Easter and Christmas. Question for you. Um, 
this is only open to people who have not looked in their diary for next year. When's Easter going to be next year? Okay, end of March, you think? Have you looked in your diary? She's looked in her diary. Look, a guilty grin on her face. She can't hide her. So yeah, I mean, I mean, Easter is based on the first, um, the first Sunday after the first full moon after equinox. It's totally lunar based even today. And Christmas, I'm going to come back to Christmas later. Um, I do a whole page about how all the early church fathers over a period of about 400 years tried to decide when Jesus was born. They haven't got a clue. Uh, haven't got a clue. And uh, all the various dates go from, um, you know, November, February, December, uh, April, one church father suggested. So the reason Christmas was chosen is because it occurs midway through the major summer sol uh, winter solstice festivals. December the 25th is when they say you can first see the moon, the sun start to get higher, and the days first start to get longer. That's why it's slightly after the solstice, which is the darkest day. So, uh, but I'll discuss that later on. It's an interesting subject. And of course, the parallel there is that in the olden days, on December the 25th, it was, of course, the old sun, S-U-N, that was being reborn, but now it's the sun, S-O-N, that's being born. So uh, th it was perfect symbolism to fit the bill. So I'm just going to go through and give a few examples of things you might encounter in churches and in the Bible. Angels, of course, we all know those creatures with the wings that you see in a lot of churches, but it's an ancient tradition. You see Matt there, often dons wings, Egyptian, Lilith, the lady of the night. Um, from uh, Sumeria, Mesopotamia. You can see there's her owls there. And Eros and the Roman equivalent Cupid all have these wings. Uh, they usually often, um, in, they often intercede, intercede between uh, the gods and, uh, uh, and mortals. They often bring messages or make announcements uh, for others. And I look at the archangels in some detail in the book, but I've just picked St. Michael out here. This is a fabulous, fabulous stained glass window. That's about life size, actually, with those iridescent purple wings from Dorset. And he's got the scales. He's weighing up at, at, the, um, at the pearly gates, whether you've been good, naughty or whether you've been nice, like at Father Christmas does every Christmas when you put your little stocking up. So um, he's making a list. Yeah, but of course there's ancient precedents. There's two examples there of, um, of pharaohs and high priests sometimes having their heart weighed against a feather uh, to see whether the pharaoh has been good. And of course the feather always weighs down the pharaoh's heart because he's been so righteous. Yeah, right. So uh, it's a bit of spin reader, but you can see how everything comes from something else. Any, anything that's got major symbolism and really important in pagan symbolism has to be brought into the new religion. It has to be. So um, the flood. This is a new one I think I've done before. Um, you look at any of the ancient cultures and the indigenous cultures today, uh, Native American and uh, Aboriginal, they all have a flood myth. Um, sometimes it's, it's because man has done something naughty. Um, it's, it's sometimes a realignment of, of natural laws when we've put our spanner in the works and so to speak. Um, sometimes it's an argument between gods, they're all variations, but the flood is such a common story in ancient myths and um, a lot of those myths researchers think could uh, arise from um, the Black Sea, the flooding of the Black Sea, some of you might be aware of in prehistory, and of course Atlantis. Atlantis has very much been tied in with, um, with the flood myths. But I mean, here, here's, here's one we know, of course, this is Noah, bless him, with his ark. You look, you guys look a bit heavy. I wouldn't open that window too often. Look at that. So um, there's with his ark. But of course, uh, Vishnu turned into a large fish during the, the Hindu myth of the flood. Uh, this is him escorting the people. So you can see the precedent here. And this actually is Babylonian. This is uh, from the tales of Gilgamesh. This, this is the, uh, the man and woman escaping this in, in the boat. So there is a flood myth right back in Babylonian um, times as well. So the idea of a flood to cleanse things, if you like, is a very ancient concept. So of course it was brought into the Bible. Um, the, the tree of life and the first people is a very ancient concept. Some of you might have heard of the cosmic tree, the axis Monday, the world tree. The idea of some symbolic tree or energetic tree, in fact, that links the underworld, goes up to the, the, spiritual, the, the physical world and then links us with the heavens. There's an Egyptian example there. Um, this one I found, I think, is the Tree of Life uh, in a tomb in Brittany. That's officially a Tree of Life on Malta. 
That's the Babylonian one again. Uh, this is um, the Kabbalah, the Jewish Kabbalah, which is, of course, the tree of life, um, which you can work your way up symbolically. So, of course, this had to be brought into Christianity. And, of course, it is in the forms of the big columns. Sometimes you might have stood in the, um, in the vaulted roofs in a cathedral. It's just like standing in a forest, isn't it? And that's the whole point, really. And um, sometimes you'll have columns like this. Uh, this is the famous apprentice pillar at Roslyn Chapel. And uh, these, this foliage is going around. It looks like the strands of DNA, really. The, you know, the Templars or their equivalent knew exactly what they were doing. And it all issues out of the mouths of dragons, which represents the life force of the planet. And I mentioned the Tree of Life, and of course, this is exactly what you get with the crucifixion. Almost certainly, Jesus was cross crucified on a cross that was this shape. You know? The, the Saltair cross, that was the shape generally implied by the Romans. But it was turned upright, I believe, because now this is the tree of life. This tree in this stained glass window in Wiltshire has even got leaves on it. It's literally living. And of course, now you put Jesus halfway up it. And now the only way to get up to the heavenly realms is through Jesus. He's now sitting or hanging on the tree of life. And just to prove that, Arbe Vita is in this Christian window and it means tree of life. So no pretense there. So you stick Jesus on your tree of life now, then the only way to get to the higher realms is through Jesus. A brilliant bit of, bit of uh, symbolism, really. So um, a, talk, <laughs> a talk like mine w wouldn't be complete, would it, without a few fallacies thrown in, and I didn't want to disappoint you guys. <laughs> so uh, the, the green man, uh, of course, is, we all like looking for green men in churches, uh, but it's a very ancient concept. I'll just show a couple here. This is Geb, who's usually shown in green. He's the Egyptian fertility god, uh, about to make love to his sister, Nus. The, the Egyptians did do that sort of thing. And um, again, it's about, all about fertility of the land rather than just sex per se. Uh, Osiris, if you see some original uh, temple paintings of him with the colours intact, he's nearly always in green. He's the green man, it's his phallus that fertilises the Nile. Green Tara is called, uh, I think, the mother of all Buddhas, I think is her one name. She's the, like, the goddess of the Buddha um, tradition. And uh, even Islam has a, has a dude all in green, looks a bit like a druid, doesn't he? He's called al Qadir, the green one. And uh, the, he's part of the Islam tradition, he's always in green, he hangs out in a forest, he often stands on or carries a fish. I don't know whether he has many friends. I don't know, but he's, uh, he's got this smelly fish. He hasn't just come from the chipper, he actually rides on a fish. So again, all traditions have their equivalent of the green man. So this major emblem had to be brought into the church. And of course it is in the form of the green man. Um, so it, it, it's the male it, the spirit, the, the hidden spirit of, of the land. But now of course, um, instead of it being Pan or Sununus that's blessing the fields, of course it's now God, singular. By bringing the green man into the trees, you're bringing that major symbol that all the, all the locals recognise, uh, but now it's God that's blessing the fields. Uh, to me, when I look at the green man, if you look at these three images, they are just fabulous. To me, they look into my very soul. You know, they're almost saying, what the hell have you been doing to the planet the last few thousand years? So it's the very soul of nature, I think, that returns our gaze. This is three fabulous examples from Dorset, Wiltshire, and Roslyn Chapel. All the images I'm showing you today are in the book. It would be very unfair of me to show you any that aren't in the book. So, oh, more fallacies. <laughs> What's he like? So the next chapter is called Phallus, the Staff of Life. And, of course, um, it's not all about female, female, female with the goddess, although in some quarters in Glastonbury you'd think the, it was, the goddess was all totally female, but no. Uh, there is the male. You have to have male and female there for, the, for everything to proliferate. So, of course, the phallus represents the yang fertilising principle. This is an Egyptian example. We've already seen the CERN giant. And this is some Roman milestones uh, they have on the Roman roads across Europe called Hermeta. They're, they're, they're based on the god Hermes. Uh, this one clearly says, go straight on. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we have road signs like that anymore? <laughs> I'd like to see the Roman one for tunnel. That would be really good anyway. Um, so... Um, you know, obscenity is not an ancient concept. It's quite recent, actually. Um, um, one of the old names for God in Judaism is, is Yahweh Sabbath. It means penis of the storm. What the hell is that doing in there? So, and even in the Bible, there's quite a lot of nudity in the Old Testament. Uh, da King David, you might remember, danced naked before the Ark of the Covenant. There's nothing wrong with nudity. 
in the early, even in the early phases of Christianity, but of course later on in medieval times things become a little bit more stricter. So uh, look at this for a statement. Yay, there's me again. It's enough to make any guy feel totally insecure. Um, there's another three metres under the ground. And of course, when I see things like that, ask yourself, is this a phallus sticking out of the ground or is it a phallus penetrating Mother Earth? So there's two ways of looking at it, isn't there? There's lots of these phallic stones that Avery with identified. Uh, and even the Maypole, I found records from Rome that during festivals of Attis and Priapus, the phallic and the sun gods, uh, Maypoles were erected. So it's an ancient concept. So next time you see children dancing around a maypole at a village fete, whatever you do, don't tell their parents that their kids are dancing around a large dick. Okay. <laughs> or, else or else the police will be called and you'll be carted off somewhere. So, um, but that's exactly what they're doing. So uh, that's why they're so popular at May, the old pagan fertility festivals. So leading on to that, before anybody screams with shock, um, these are all Christian carvings, paid for by Christians, carved by skilled Christian masons at great expense by skilled masons. These are not whimsies, they're not follies, they, are, they mean something. Uh, I think this biggest one is from France, why aren't we surprised? Um, another one from Spain, I think, and even this one is from Christchurch in Britain. Uh, it's a bit colder over here, so you can see if it's smaller. <laughs> um, so I think these originally represented the yang, regenerative power of nature, uh, the opposite to the shilinigigs, if you like. So you have to have, but I think, I think only later did it come to represent sins of the flesh. Because I've always thought it a bit strange. Why are we putting things on the outside of the churches we're trying to get people not to do? Isn't that a bit strange? We don't want people to have sex anymore. Let's put loads of willies on the outside of the churches. <laughs> That'll work. So, um, you know, if I'm running a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous, I'm not going to set up a free bar in the corner. <laughs> Help yourself. Um, so I think originally these had an original meaning, another meaning. They were meant to represent the male fertilising principle. Only later on, when things become more pious, do they... Oh, yes, this is what we'll call these. They're now reminded us of sins of the flesh. Um... They don't do that at all. So uh, opposite to that, of course, is the divine yoni, the opening of the goddess through which everything issues. There's some fine examples here. St. Nectin's Glen, the amniotic fluid of her body comes through this vulva hole. This is a cave where we do shamanic drumming near Bristol every year, if you want to join us. Fabulous in there, the vulva of the Earth Mother. This is one we've identified as an original feature in Avery. And, uh, of course, Menantol lends itself to feminine symbolism. Uh, and, of course, this was brought into the church, surprisingly enough. Uh, you can't think of a more Catholic, pious country, hardly, than Ireland. And the greatest number of Sheelander gigs in the world is in Ireland. And they've survived, and they're still used for, you know, for certain rituals. This is a she-devil under the Archbishop of Canterbury's altar at Canterbury. This one is French again. Why aren't we surprised? Um, this one uh, is in Royston Cay, possibly Knights Templars in design and age. This is the Sheila gig exposing herself there, and I think this is Excalibur. I think this is the phallus, the yin, the yang, the female, the male, right next to each other. And of course, the most famous one is at Kilpeck. Has anybody been to see the one at Kilpeck? Yeah, fabulous. And I mean, look at that, it's like an alien, isn't it? It's like an alien, absolutely fabulous. In some parts of uh, Britain and Ireland, some of the vulvas, if they're down at ground level, are worn smooth by newlywed <coughs> couples, touching them for fertility festivals, even today, with the blessing of the vicar. Have you touched my vulva yet, the vicar would be saying. Yeah. So it's, it's, <laughs> it's, all, it's all part of the, of the marriage ritual. So this is the only reason this one isn't worn is because it's several feet off the ground. So um, it's amazing that these are on the outside of churches, and they're not whimsies. This took a lot of money to be carved by a very skilled mason. It isn't just, oh, we've got a bit of stone left over, what shall we do with it? Far from it. And from that, ironic ironically, is where Christianity gets its fish from. It's the vulva of the Earth Mother. Don't tell them. So uh, you can see it here in the Vesica Pisces, male, female, yin, yang. And of course, where male and female come together, where they overlap, is the creative force of the universe. It's the vulva of the Earth Mother. Sometimes the fish, of course, has the name of Jesus in the middle of it. Uh, ex an extension from this is what we call the areola, the mandora, or the nimbus. You often get this lozenge-shaped, uh, almond-shaped area around 
um, a key character. It's a bit like a teacher will write something on the blackboard and then he might circle it in chalk to emphasize it. So main players in several religions have these around. This is an Eastern one. This is Helios, the Greek sun god. Uh, this is Buddha, of course. His is generally in the shape of a lotus leaf. So, uh, and of course you find Jesus, God, or the Virgin Mary inside the Christian equivalent. Everything comes from something else. And even the halo, you couldn't think anything more Christian than a halo, could you? They, all churches, all the main players, the saints, they all have a halo to represent their wisdom and sometimes uh, their piety. Uh, and uh, I think it started with this originally. I think it's the sun disks, because a, e a lot of early Christians, as you might know, went down to Egypt. So the first cross-fertilization is two ways. Look at this one. This is Artemis, the Greek goddess of fertility. Um, I think we can take that as red. <laughs> um, so uh, this is a Hittite one. There's the halo around there. Uh, even the Buddha can sport a halo. Look at that. That is a halo. Yeah. Represent his knowledge, his enlightenment. And I could probably fool you into saying, well, this is an early Christian, Christian Roman depiction of Jesus with the halo around him. But it's not. It's the sun god Apollo. So you can see how Jesus was replacing all of these sun <coughs> gods. So he had to have this halo around him. There are many levels of what a halo means. I'll discuss it more in the book. It's a symbol of Gnosis, of the sun disk, in fact. Some of these often have a red cross on them. So, and, um, so you can see where everything comes from. Fascinating, I think. Um, I, I look at all the animals and birds in the book. Any animal and bird you can find in, 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 um, in a church, uh, I, I deal with in the book. But I've only dealt with two today, really important ones. One is the serpent and the other one's the dragon. Serpents are really universal. They occur in countries and cultures right across the world, going back thousands of years. And uh, that, to me, they represent the life force, the kundalini that goes up your body, but also the earth energies that go around the planet. And uh, this, I think, is the plumed serpent, Quetzalcoatl, of uh, the Aztecs in the British Museum, this gorgeous yin-yang, male-female. Uh, this is the snake goddess, the famous one in the, Mino uh, in the um, Minoan snake goddess in the Mediterranean, yin-yang, male-female. Everything's in balance. <coughs> Uh, has anybody been to Chichen Itza at Equinox? Oh, you lucky people. You lucky people. Um, okay, come and tell them what happens. She's shaking her head. Okay, I'll do it. So uh, at Equinox, twice a year, for a few days at East Equinox, these, as the sun rises, these steps cast this shadow. And there's the serpent coming down. And there's the head at the bottom. How cool is that? That's certainly on my hit list, definitely. So uh, the Rainbow Serpent is another famous one. This is an Aboriginal cave painting of it. Uh, the Naga of India are the beings, part serpent. And the uh, Great Serpent Mound in Ohio, which I'm sure Paul has been to, haven't you? Imagine, have you? I've embarrassed him. Oh, no, he hasn't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, Paul hasn't been to this, and uh, neither have I, so there we are. So uh, this is obviously a huge serpent, several hundred metres long, disgorging or, 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 um, uh, or issuing the cosmic egg. So it's the balance of male and female again. So serpents, of course, are brought into Christianity. They have rather a bad lot in the Bible because of the snake, the serpent, that tempted uh, Eve you know, and Adam. God, why on earth did he take that apple? And, um, and serpents are often depicted um, as cohorts of the devil. Uh, there are a few exceptions where serpents are positive, but not many. And again, you find them on lots of church architecture. This one, actually, uh, these two are both associated with earth energies. This is at Stoke Trista, where two energy nodes come together. There's two serpents. So which is first, chicken or the egg? And this is a creditum, where I'm taking the Somerset Dowser shortly. They're the only serpents in the whole of Crediton Church, I can assure you. I've looked on all the columns. They're the only serpents. And they wear the Michael and Mary current cross. That cannot be coincidence. Cannot be coincidence. So, um, again, look for serpents in churches. It, it's often reflecting, perhaps, what the energies are doing. So, um, St. Luke is the patron saint of hospitals, doctors, nurses, everything to do with medicinal things. And he's got the caduceus on him, the two servants of the staff. But he comes directly from Asclepius. Asclepius was the classical god of medicine, of healing, of doctors, all the list that's under St. Luke. And he's got one serpent, generally, because he is the other one. Uh, in some myths, Asclepius actually changes into a snake to do healing. So there's the two snakes. 
brought from there, from, and from Germany, <laughs> straight into Christian symbolism. Wonderful, isn't it? So the other beast, of course, is dragons. Uh, again, universal in their occurrence and almost in what they mean, really. They represent the life force of the earth. Sometimes dragons can be guarding something, treasure, which is often, I think, a metaphor for wisdom. We think of treasure now as money, but, of course, treasure in ancient times can be much more than that. This, of course, the Vikings had a big preoccupation with dragons. This is a, this is a Greek one, which is legless. I don't mean he's been around the pub. Um, and, of course, the Chinese have a big preoccupation with dragons. They have the Year of the Dragon. The Chinese New Year festivals always feature a dragon. And in a lot of Eastern myths, um, they, they think that when an eclipse occurs, this was the one that occurred this year, which I photographed from my garden. And uh, they, they think this is the dragon, don't they, eating the sun. So uh, they all have to make a load of noise, hoping that they'll frighten the dragon away. So dragons, of course, have to be brought into... Uh, Christian uh, symbolism, and, and I think mainly through the dragon slayers. Of course, dragon, dragons became to represent everything the church wanted to replace. Paganism, heathenism, uh, and sometimes even just represent a common enemy like the Vikings, you know. So, um, and of course the two great dragon slayers are George and Michael. George generally has a red cross on him somewhere or other. Uh, Michael has wings, actually usually you can tell him. And uh, even this has an ancient precedent. This is Gilgamesh chasing Tiamat, the dragon queen, away. So even, um, I think this is 500 BC, the writing is on the wall. You know, the female is on the run. Men are here to stay as regards ruling everything. Because after this time, all religions are run by men for men. Let's face it, ladies. Do you agree, ladies? Yes, yes thank you. Phew. Um, so yes, uh, you can see, if you look hard enough, and sometimes you don't have to look very hard at all, you'll see a precedent for Christian symbolism. And this is two dragons on the font at Avery. When we do our workshops at Avery, uh, we generally take people to here, because the Michael and Mary flow of the St. Michael line come through Avery, and this is the original uh, Norman stroke Templar font. Uh, there's a bishop here with his, with his crook, his crozier, He's holding what they say is a prayer book, but it more, looks more like a pint to me. I don't know about you. And why wouldn't you? And he's, he's got his staff very firmly on the back neck of the dragon. So, um, you know, the, they're making a statement there, aren't they? There's a, there's a new god in town. So, um, I've had to skip a few sections out, but I thought one I would look at is the triple goddess. Um, in a lot of ancient cultures, the goddess is split into three. It often represents the turning year, spring, summer, winter. Uh, and it also represents uh, the parallels in a, in a woman's life, maiden, mother, and crone. So there is this parallel, like, you know, linking women to, to deity. Some people say that the, uh, this possibly, I'm undecided, represents the triple goddess at Newgrange. But there's a couple of examples there that are Roman, and you can see that the triple goddess there, and you'll see in, in both cases uh, the mother is holding the baby. Uh, there and there. So this, ha this was a major theme in a lot of ancient cultures, especially uh, ancient European cultures. So I think, you know, it was brought into the church through these. Faith, hope and charity and mercy, justice and humility are always shown as three women. I've never found an exception to this. Never found an exception. And if you look closely, especially on faith, open charity, one of them is all is holding a baby. I mean, it is so obvious. The triple goddess is there in Christianity. She's there. You just have to, have to look for her. So I don't think a lot of the characters in the Bible actually existed. They're metaphors, they're allegories. They're also made, making the Judaic claim on, on the Middle East. That's what a lot of the spin of the Old Testament is about. So I'm not saying that's right or wrong, I'm just saying that's it, you're creating a heritage line back through the Old Testament. But I think one person who did exist is Moses. What a cool dude I think he was. I think he's, he's actually a Bronze Age shaman and magician. Everything I read about him. There's Stukeley's drawing of, of, um, of a uh, druid and it really fits the, uh, the Moses caricature. And, and here he is. This is uh, Moses doing his impersonation of Charlton Heston. <laughs> and he does it pretty good, I think. But in Egyptian text, there's two characters, actually in Egyptian text, at that time that Moses is around, called Toth Moses and Tut Moses. I discussed the different uh, theologians and scholars 
uh, interpretation of this and their discussion on this. It could be the same guy, just spelt differently, but there are some subtle differences. One um, is a priest that went all through the mystery schools and then got banished and thrown out of Egypt. Sounds a bit like Moses. The other one actually was found in the bulrushes and brought into the, uh, the royal family and brought up as an Egyptian and then was disgraced and kicked away from, from uh, Egypt. And they both got the element Moses in them, which is a bit of a coincidence, really. So uh, look what Moses did. He went on vision quests. Sometimes he took himself away from his tribe for years, which is classic shamanic practice. Separate yourself from your, from your, your peers. Uh, and he did a lot of magic. He even did weather manipulation. You know, it's classic druidic kind of pagan shamanic practices. And um, uh, there's, a, there's a substance in the, in the Bible called mana. When... when um, when uh, Moses leaves the, the Israelites out into uh, the desert, they eat something called mana. And one scholar says, this is magic mushrooms that grow in the desert. Uh, because you have to collect the mana in the morning. Well, that's before the hot desert sun dissolves all the mushrooms that have occurred during the night. It's the only plant that does that. So uh, I, th I think Moses the shaman took some up Mount Sinai with him. Uh, on his, you know, he went up there twice, and when he sees the burning bush, I'm not quite sure why they put Jesus and Mary in there, but still, I found this in a window. So, um, you know, I is he high on mushrooms? I don't know. Is he seeing the aura of the bush? Is that what the Bible's trying to tell us? The early uh, translators of the Bible probably didn't have a word for aura, did they, really? So, um, and, the, and the other miracle of Moses, uh, he taps a rock when the Israelites are dying in the desert, and um, water, st water starts to flow. And that's exactly what uh, Mithras does in one of the tales. And even uh, Moses parting the Red Sea, I, I quote a discussion by a couple of scholars in the book that they've, re they've looked at the old translations and say, no, no, it shouldn't be Red Sea at all, it's Reed Sea. It's the, de it's the delta of northern Egypt. It's the delta, and they, and they relate the pulling back of the water to a tsunami, the pre-tsunami, and a volcano going off where the sea retreats. So I don't say any of these are right or wrong, but I just put it all in there as a discussion uh, of the possibilities. And um, Moses is often shown in churches with horns on. He hasn't been a naughty boy, but you might have noticed that. There he's holding the tablets. This is in Roslyn Chapel. Because the early Aramaic translations into Greek and Roman, you'll read in the Bible, it says Moses came down from Mount Sinai and he has horns. And I'm thinking, what's going on here? But somebody has recently retranslated that. He says, oh no, it shouldn't say that. It should be saying, Moses is giving off horn-like rays. Now, doesn't that make a difference? Doesn't that make a difference? I think Moses comes down from Mount Sinai with, uh, I with the tablets in such a state of bliss. I think they can see his aura. I think he is just so in one. So in light, he's got that moment of gnosis, and I think he's glowing with light. They can see his light body. I think that's what's happening. How would you have translated that <laughs> 2,000 years ago? You wouldn't have had a chance, would you? So um, this is what he thinks it should say, this scholar. And some more forward windows do actually show Moses with rays coming out of his head. Yay! So, uh, but what about the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down from Sinai? Are they even Hebrew? Are they? Look at that. If this is... Um, Moses, if they date him around 1500 BC, around that time the Egyptian Book of the Dead was being put together. Spell 125 said at funerals, this is the word supposed to be said by the deceased, I have done no falsehood, I have not robbed, I have not reviled God, etc, etc, etc. This is the Ten Commandments. It was already be, uh, in Egypt. And the reason Moses came down from the mountain with them, because he already knew them. Whether he was tough Moses or tut Moses, he'd spent a life in the Egyptian mystery schools. He already knew about this. So, of course, he needed to give his tribe some rules. What better than the ones he already knew? So, um, you could say God gave them to Moses, but they gave them to Moses via the Egyptian mystery schools. Let's just put it like that. Isn't it fascinating? A lot of heroes, uh, like Gandalf and uh, some of the gods, have staffs where they do a lot of magic with, you know, they go vump, zap, you know, what's mo what did Charlton Neston say? Behold the hand of God, and then the sea retreats. A staff seems very important. And uh, the Bible says Mount, um, when Moses died, he was taken up to Mount Nebo uh, and, um, by God. And uh, uh, there was an excavation in 1839 at a, at a place called the Cave of Moses, uh, where they found a staff. And this staff over... 
the last hundred years have gone from museum to private collector back to another museum and eventually I tracked it down because that staff had the words Tough Moses on it. Interesting, isn't it? And where I found this staff was in the Museum and Art Gallery in Birmingham. <laughs> Birmingham, my hometown, where I'd been to as a kid many times. The words Tough Moses are on the one end of this staff. So if Moses, there aren't many bits of evidence where you can link, link actual bits of evidence to, which aren't circumstantial to characters in the Old Testament, but I think this is one. I think Moses was one of us, really, a bit of a new age shaman, a bit of a hippie, you know? Great man, great man. So, um, oh, hello, it's gone right to the end slide. It did this once before when I used Alan's projector. Let me just... Let me just see why it's gone forward. <coughs> These things come to try us, don't they, really? No peeping. So, um, okay, I'm not quite sure why it did that, but we'll have a go. We're back. Another feature, another feature you often see in churches is the Holy Grail. Of course, all the Holy Grail myths, they all have ancient precedents. Islam, the classical myths, uh, the Gundustrup cauldron there has a the uh, bran dipping people in the cauldron of regeneration. It's the idea of this, this thing that can restore life and the land. Of course, King Arthur is very much associated with the Holy Grail and uh, Joseph of Arimathea at Glastonbury. But I started noticing these windows of Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. You know, just before he's arrested, all the disciples go to sleep and he's praying. And they nearly always showed the Grail or a Grail or some cup. You know, I don't think this is the one used at the Last Supper and the angels just said, don't worry about the washing up, I'll do it. You know, it's nothing like that. He, he's getting it. There he is praying. This is such a poignant move. And I think the grail uh, shown with Jesus there is because he, it's his moment of gnosis. It's when he's getting it. It's when he knows he is not going to die. Part of him, his light body, is going to go on. He gets it. And uh, I think the grail is inside all of us. Whether you regard the grail as the, the pregnant tomb, of, uh, the tummy of Mary Magdalene, or the body of Mary Magdalene, uh, or whatever, I don't think it matters. I think the grail is relevant no matter what you think the grail is. And whoever thinks what the grail is, you're all correct. Because it's this thing that brings you on to a greater purpose, a greater knowing, a greater acknowledgement. So I don't think there is a right or wrong grail. It's whatever you decide it is. And this is the beauty of symbols. Everybody can be right. The beauty of myths. So the two main concepts of ancient spiritualities really are the divine feminine and the divine masculine, the god and the goddess. A few examples here of the divine feminine at Silbury Hill. and uh, The moon is very often depicted as feminine in ancient cultures. And of course one aspect of this is the moon goddess. Some examples there. This one's 35,000 years old. Uh, this is a Roman one at Bath and a Greek one. Usually the goddess, the moon goddess, is represented by a crescent moon. I show a lot of examples in the book. And she's known as the Queen of Heaven in lots of cultures. Of course she is. But who are you going to replace the Queen of Heaven with? Well, there's only one candidate really, isn't there? There she is. In some Catholic services, even today, there's a couple of lines in the service where the, where the people in the congregation shout, shout out Mary as the Queen of Heaven. It's seamless, really. And there she is standing on the crescent moon, just like the old gods and goddesses are. And she's in blue and white. It's nothing to do with her purity. It's because it's the colours of the waters and the colour of the moon. It's the, it's the ancient aspect of the divine feminine. It's fantastic. Um, you couldn't make it up, and they didn't. It was already there. <laughs> so um, the other aspect, of course, as well as the moon, is the earth mother aspect. She who births everything. There's a Babylonian one there on the left with her sun god. Uh, there's a Hittite one there. There's the mother goddess with the solar uh, sun. Um, there's the pharaoh there next uh, on the lap of Isis. He fancies himself as a bit of a solar god. And the top right one is uh, an Egyptian mother goddess with her solar sun on her lap. And uh, you know where I'm going with this, don't you? There it is. Left is Egyptian, the right is Indian, Krishna being suckled, and of course it was perfect to take on Mary suckling the new solar god, who is Jesus. It seems, this is such a major icon, uh, there's no way this could be left out of Christian pantheism. And of course it isn't. It's just a seamless transition. Uh, I'd have been very surprised if that hadn't have been included. It was such a major symbol. 
So, of course, what do you do with the sun god? Um, we know how, Jesus, how the goddess was replaced, we think, with Mary. I, I, I go into it in much more detail in the book. Sorry I have to skim through this. So I think the sun god of the ancients was metamorphosed into Jesus, who took over the role of the sun gods as the new divine masculine solar deity. I've got a question for you. It's not a trick question, honest. <laughs> um, who was famously born on December the 25th to a virgin mother, died and rose three days later? His name begins with J. Who is it? Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Right. Jesus, yes. You're the only one in the room that knew it. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> the answer is Jesus. But hang on a second. It was a trick question. <laughs> All of these gods were born, on, born or celebrated on December the 25th to a virgin mother and were involved in some sort of resurrection. Egyptian, Greek, uh, Babylonian, Sumerian, uh, Krishna even, Roman, Greek, and several more I couldn't even get on the slide, all fit those top three characteristics. So Jesus is not the reason <coughs> for the season. I'm afraid. He took over the role. If he's taking the role of all these gods over, he has to have their characteristics. Or else the pagans who you're trying to convert will say, hang on, that's not my god. Where's my god? Oh yes, December the 25th, Virgin Mother. Yes, there he is. You've just called him, you've just got a different name for him now. Fabulous, isn't it? So, um, look at all these attributes. Would you agree that all these attributes are associated with Jesus? Is there anything on that list that isn't associated with Jesus? Please say. Fisher of men, light of the world, palm leaves, walking on water. But if you look at the top line, all of those I've lifted out of the names and myths of gods and goddesses. Nothing on that list is to do with Jesus, but everything on that list is to do with Jesus. It's quite amazing uh, how this happens. The left-hand side is the, is the Persian, later Roman god, Mithras. He's emerging from a cave after being in there for three days. Yeah? I think that's dated 200 BC. And the one on the right, look at the date on that. Tumaz, the Sumerian god, holding two crosses. So, uh, and look at Jesus. Jesus, um, as you know, is the Lamb of God. He's the sacrificial lamb, the altruistic Christ who gives himself over for his people. But as you can see, there's two other examples there. The top one is Greek, and the bottom one is Roman, of their gods, Hermes, holding lambs. Um, so, isn't that amazing? So, everything comes from something else. Quite amazing. So, this very controversial object on the left was found in underwater excav excavations in Alexandria. And look at the date on it. Somebody being, somebody being crucified. But it's not Jesus, it's Orpheus Bacchus, one of the gods he replaced. And this one on the right blew my mind when I saw the date on it. Here's this dude, for, uh, Sumerian, uh, Assyrian god, Shamash, sporting a very nice crucifix, isn't it? A cross. 9th century BC. Because the cross is an ancient sun symbol. That's why Jesus was adopted, given it as his, his symbol. Look at, look at those there. Near uh, Bronze Age, the top two. The Ankh, of course, is an Egyptian cross with, a, with the vulva of the Earth Mother stuck on the top. And look at the, uh, look at the swastika. Buddhist and some other ancient cultures. Have the, that's, a, that's a rotating cross. So everything comes from something else. The Nazis, of course, turned it the other way around. Um, so was Jesus a shaman? I, th I think he was. I'm not even going to discuss whether Jesus existed or not. That's a whole different argument, which I do touch on briefly in the book. But if he did, I think Jesus was a shaman. He went on vision quests, he did miracles, he did healing, he walked on water, which several of the old gods did, by the way. Um, and uh, I love this one from a cathedral in France. Magic mushrooms, yay! So, um, so I like this. This, is, this was found... Uh, in Alexander Bay, underwater excavations. They couldn't date it any more than that, I'm afraid. But look what's on the side of it. Jesus the magician. So even the early followers of this guy, Jesus, <coughs> regarded him as a shame and a magician. It doesn't say Jesus, son of God, does it? Okay, so all of that was to happen later. Even the term Nazarene. There was no such place as Nazareth at the time of Jesus. Nazareth, Nazarene, means to behold or envision. He's a shaman. <coughs> He's a shaman. Wow, F worthy of starting a religion, as worthy as Buddha, I would suggest. I'm not having a knock at Jesus at all. I'm just trying to say what the truth is to me. Um, I like this one. I've just, this is the mis mischief in me. I've just compared this, this uh, 
image of Archonaton, the ancient Greek pharaoh, under the one God, the Artem. And I just like the similarity between Jesus playing to his one God in the Garden of Gethsemane. Wonderful. To me, it doesn't take anything away from the Jesus message. Did Jesus live or not? Did the grail exist or not? It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, whatever the answer, it does not devalue his message of love, which is what Jesus mainly chose uh, to talk about. So perhaps, the myths, perhaps with myths, we should not concentrate as to whether the myth is historically accurate, but rather is it spiritually valid. That's all we need to know, isn't it, really? But we've had the divine masculine and the divine feminine, but of course the magic happens, ladies and gentlemen, doesn't it, when the male and female get together. That's another chance for you to go, ooh. Yes, okay. <laughs> pitiful, pitiful. So, um, and of course, it's all about the balance of yin and yang. The gods and goddesses have to get together to procreate for creation to happen. Um, there's a Hindu example there, Sumerian. There's Hera and, uh, oh, God. Zeus, thank you, there. And of course, the famous erotic car carvings of India. So it's the god and goddess, the yin and yang getting together so, so life can happen. Um, so if Jesus took over the role of the sun god, you might ask, where's his consort? Well, of course, here she is. She's been here all the time. At the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, Jesus was proclaimed divine, the son of God. Before 325 AD, he was just a prophet, a wonderful man worth following. But at that date, all the bishops got together, right, let's call him the son of God. That's it. So, of course, from that date... Jesus couldn't possibly do mortal things like getting married and sex, all that icky, sticky stuff. You couldn't have the Son of God doing all that, but of course he was married and he had a, he had a consort. And it was Mary Magdalene, probably a priestess of Isis, his spiritual equal. He's not going to marry anybody, you know, with a lesser knowledge than himself. She's a priestess of Isis. Even Christos means the anointed one, and she's anointing him. Uh, and only, only Mary Magdalene is ever shown at the foot of the cross at a crucifixion scene. And Romans would only allow the wife of a condemned man to be at the foot of the cross at a crucifixion. That's in Roman law. Um, there's Mary Magdalene in a couple of scenes where she's anointing Jesus' feet. Remember, she anoints him with her, with her oil and, um, and then she dries it with her hair. And it's an ancient ritual in Hebrew and Sumerian. Uh, marriages, right? And also done by Egyptian priestesses. I found out that in ancient Hebrew law, if, a, if an unmarried woman even touches a man, she can be taken out and stoned. No trial, no judging or anything. So she must have been married or else the disciples would have used this as the perfect opportunity to get rid of her. Because they were as, sh they were as thick as two short planks, the rest of them. He, she had the knowledge. She, she was the one who was his spiritual equal, in my opinion. Um, she's at all the key scenes in the Passion. She's the only person who is at all the key scenes in the Passion. She's there when jo she takes him down from the cross with Joseph and Arimathea. She's there um, in two of the Gospels. Mary, on her own, is there in the garden when he goes to look for Jesus. In, um, and the angel said, why have you come here? He's risen. But in one of the other Gospels, it's the three Marys. So there is a variation on that one. And who's the first person that Jesus appears to when he has risen? It's Mary, his missus. He'd have got a real telling off, wouldn't he, if he'd have <laughs> appeared to anybody else. But anybody else would have been freaked out by it. She is his metaphysical equal. She gets it. She knows. I, I think she even knew it was going to happen. She calls him rabbi in the Bible, do you remember? She calls him rabbi. You, rabbis in those days, and I think it's even respected today, have to be married. It's a sign of their authority, their steadfastness, their fact that they're going to procreate the species. So the, when she calls him rabbi, I think is really important. That's in the Bible. Um, interesting, isn't it? So this is, the really, the, this is the real Mary Magdalene, ladies. Be inspired by this woman. She's wise, she's sensuous, she's feisty. Strength of character, wealthy, independent, a priestess. She lived life on the edge. Mother or wife, that's still being debated. But of course, all these characteristics were what the early church fathers did not want women to be. So that's why Mary, an inspiration of women in the early days, was victimised. Nowhere in the Bible does it say Mary Magdalene was a prostitute. Nowhere. You show me the verse. And I found these. A lady pregnant, dre dressed, uh, resting her alabaster jar on her stomach. It's Mary Magdalene. 
Look at this one in the uh, Knights Templar Stroke Hospitaller Church. Um, it's a Renaissance painting, I believe. It's supposed to be Madonna and Child. It's supposed to be Mary and Jesus. Do me a favour. She's in red, bright scarlet. She's the scarlet woman, red flowing hair. Mary Magdalene is usually depicted with red or white hair. And the genitals of the baby are covered up. I think this is Mary Magdalene with her child. And this is the very famous one, hidden away up in the Heelands of Scotland on the Isle of Mull. Uh, it's a new, they're newlyweds. Look at the love. Look at the, the holding hands. And she's clearly pregnant. She can't even get that sash around her stomach. That's a Christian window, don't forget. Some people know the truth. And they've been leaving us the signs. It's all about Heros Gamus. It's all about the divine masculine and the divine feminine coming together for the healing of mankind and of the land. So this one I found, which I'm not aware anybody had recorded at all anywhere, um, is a window in St. Neots in Cornwall. It's a scene of the crucifixion. There's Jesus hanging on the cross. There's a woman to the left holding a baby up to him as he's on the cross. She's got long flowing blonde hair. The Mother Mary is never depicted like that. This is Mary Magdalene. She's the one depicted with long, beshevelled red or blonde hair. I think that's Mary Magdalene showing Jesus her child. There's some, uh, Lynn Picknett and some other researchers think that Mary was pregnant at the time of the crucifixion and she fled, you know, and had the baby somewhere else. But others believe she was pregnant, but they'd already had a child. There are two different names that come up in the Mary Magdalene tradition. So uh, isn't that interesting? A lot of people are getting very excited about that window. Even in the Bible, John the Baptist, you remember, calls Jesus the bridegroom. It's there in the Bible. So, um, and this is a great one. I've almost finished now. This is a great painting in Bournemouth Museum, the Russell Coates Museum. It's a great procession of the, in Egypt. There's Isis and Horus, the mother god and her solar son being carried through in a grand procession. But look who's sneaking in. They've just had to flee to Egypt, if you remember in the Bible, after Jesus' birth. Look at this. You can see what the artist is saying here. And it's quite relevant, isn't it? And oh, a bit sad, I think, as well. That's, you know, within a couple of hundred years, all of this is going to be replaced by these two characters who are just sneaking into Egypt unannounced. Quite a poignant painting, I think. So, um, male and female, yin and yang, it's all about living in balance and harmony. It's an ancient ideal, but I think it's needed right now. Uh, it's all about reclaiming our power, especially women. Uh, perhaps it's time to wake up from a very long slumber. Other cultures have no problem with the divine feminine. There's the Pachimama Peru, male and female there, gods, and uh, Shakti and Shiva are paraded through India. Male and female, no problem. So, because I think we've reached rock bottom. <laughs> what are you laughing at? It's a rock. Okay. Um, so I think we, you know, what on earth have we been up to the last 2,000 years? If you didn't cry, you didn't laugh, you'd have to cry. So I'm going to end up with a couple of symbols of planet Earth, which I've showed before, but with different graphics this time. This is a great symbol of the Earth, isn't it? Very powerful. It gets right to your heart. It's the Earth from space. So we could take it as a symbol of man's folly, of disrespect, of all that we have destroyed and are still destroying. You could take that as. Or you could take it as a symbol of hope, of an ever-giving mother, of love. Don't forget the Earth knows, owes us nothing. We owe her everything. As a green activist, I realised years ago that we are not fighting to save the Earth. We couldn't kill the Earth if we wanted to, believe me. We are fighting to see whether we're going to be around. That's the argument, people. That's what we're fighting for. I realised that years ago. So perhaps it's time we started to give something back to our mother. So um, there is a difference to me between religion and spirituality. Religion is for people afraid of going to hell. Spirituality is for people who have already been there. Do we agree? <laughs> yes. <laughs> mm. Thank you very much for listening to what I've had to say. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.